Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to this part two video in the power supply series. In the part one video, we talked about several topics, including the difference between RMS and peak voltage. We saw that peak voltage cannot do as much work as RMS voltage because there are empty spaces in between the uh, waveforms. And we also found that it takes uh, a lot more peak voltage, in this case 170 volts AC peak, to do the same amount of work as 120 volts of RMS voltage. We saw the conversion factors. If you're going from peak to RMS, you multiply times 0 0.707. If you're going from RMS to peak, you multiply times 1.414. We also talked about half-wave rectification, in which one of the outputs from a power transformer is run through a diode. In this case, one that is oriented uh, so that only the positive waveforms will pass. We then took the highly rippled DC output and ran it by a, an electrolytic filter capacitor to smooth it out. Then used this smoothed DC current to bias the grids of our output tubes. Hey Jack, are you ready to help me with this video? Wiggle your whiskers if you're ready to help. Okay, I'll go get Rusty to help me then. Now in today's video we're going to move on to full wave rectified power supplies. As we will see, they're a lot more efficient uh, and give us a higher voltage output than the half-wave rectification. Let's talk about the type of transformer that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to pick one with about a 1 to 5.4 winding ratio. That's the ratio between the primary and the entire secondary winding. The secondary winding will have to be center tapped so that we can ground this center tap and in effect split the secondary into two separate transformers. With this winding ratio of 1 to 5.4, if we run in 120 volts AC of RMS, we will get out 325 volts uh, from this winding, uh, from the center tap to the upper output, uh, and then from the center tap to the bottom output, we'll get another 325 volts of AC RMS output. If we add them together, the total output of the secondary is going to be 650 volts AC RMS, or a whopping 920 volts AC peak. So as you can see, although we have a single primary winding, we have what amounts to uh, two uh, separate 1 to 2.7 winding ratio secondary windings. Now, before we discuss how this works, I want to tell you that when we're finished with the discussion, we're going to go out in the workshop and see every bit of this step by step on the oscilloscope. Okay, as usual, uh, we have our input to our primary that is uh, one of two voltages depending on whether it's RMS or peak. Uh, then on the secondary, because of the grounded center tap, we're going to have two separate outputs. The upper one, because of the winding ratio of 1 to 2.7, is going to give us 2.7 times 120 volts, which would be 325 volts AC RMS, or if you're measuring uh, the peak voltage, it'll be 460 volts. And so we have this relatively large waveform uh, coming out here on the upper transformer lead. Then because of the center tap we have an equal but opposite output out of the lower transformer lead. When I say equal but opposite I mean it is of exactly the same voltage but it is uh, out of phase with the upper uh, waveform. If you look when this one's negative this one's positive. Positive, negative. And so it goes. And now you may ask, why are the two waveforms out of phase? Well, thanks to some recent hand acting classes I've been taking, I'm going to show you. 
Remember that the polarity of a transformer changes 60 times per second due to the alternating current that's being applied to the primary. Now, as this polarity changes, a waveform will be formed that corresponds to that polarity and uh, as you see right now we're going to create the negative waveform on the upper and the positive waveform on the bottom. Then it flips, it will create the positive waveform and the negative. Flip it over, we've got our negative and our positive. So as you can see, uh, 60 times per second then, due to the polarity reversals, uh, we're creating waves then that are out of phase. Now, this much up here looks just like our half wave rectification. So what you could say is that full wave is really two separate half wave rectifications. We run our uh, upper output through a diode that is oriented to only allow the positive waveforms to pass. We do the same with the lower uh, waveform output. If you notice, once again, we get our only our positive peaks, just like we did uh, with the half wave rectification. And the end result then will be a series of positive waveforms. And because the waves being put into the diode were out of phase, so are the positive waveforms. If you notice that the the lower uh, positive waveform here corresponds to the empty spot here. The empty spot here corresponds to the lower waveform. Uh, so that when we run these two waveforms together, they are like the teeth of a zipper. And once zipped, they each then are adjacent to the next waveform to form a much smoother and more energetic type of output than we got from our half wave rectifier. Now, this output is going to be a lot easier to smooth than the half wave output. If you notice, we just have these little gaps in here to fill. As our uh, output then passes by this electrolytic filter capacitor, it does not pass through it, it passes by it. And it is changed by the filter capacitor as it passes. The capacitor will charge as the waveform is rising and then discharge to fill in the gap here, this empty gap, until the next wave arrives, charge the filter capacitor, discharge to fill the gap, and we will end up with then a very, very smooth and ripple-free DC output. Now, if you notice on my diagram, the peak and RMS voltages are very consistent all the way through. Uh, and the reality is, as we discussed in part one, there is loss through these diodes. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a little bit lower due to the rectification process. Also, the diodes that we use can be separate tubular diodes like I showed you in part one, or they can both be incorporated into a full wave rectifier tube like a 5Y3 or 5U4. If that's the case, the principle is exactly the same. It's just that you can't really see the diodes because they're uh, within the tube itself. Now, hopefully while all this is fresh in your mind, let's go out in the workshop and set up an experiment where we show every single step of this process and uh, monitor it with an oscilloscope. Hey Rusty, are you going to speak for us? Are you going to speak? <coughs> speak! <coughs> speak! <coughs> Come on! No huffing and puffing. Speak! <coughs> speak! <coughs> speak! <coughs> speak! <coughs> Come on! <coughs> Come on! For our experiments, I'm going to use this new uh, filament transformer right here. Step one, let's figure out its winding ratio. By using the Variac, we're going to apply 8.79 volts of AC RMS into the transformer to get exactly one volt out of the secondary. Therefore, our winding ratio is about 8.77 to 1. And to double check if I crank the Variac up to apply 120 volts of RMS AC to the primary, I'm going to get about 13.7 volts RMS AC out of the secondary. 
which will reiterate our finding that the winding ratio is indeed about 8.77 to 1. Now using our Variac to input a steady 120 volts AC to the primary, let's measure the output from the center tap to each of the secondary output leads. So for the output from the upper secondary lead to the center tap, we'll get 7.03 volts of AC, and that is RMS. And for the output between our lower lead and the center tap, we see we have 7.03 volts of RMS AC. Okay, let's have a brief review. We put in exactly 120 volts uh, AC RMS, or 169.7 volts peak AC into our transformer. The winding ratio is 8.77 to 1. And we find that the output between the center tap and either of the secondary leads is identical at 7.03 volts AC RMS or 9.94 volts AC peak. Now just to double check, let's uh, connect across both of the secondary output leads without the center tap. We'd expect it to be around 14.06 and it is around 14.03. So the total output is indeed split uh, evenly between this lead and the center tap and this lead and the center tap. Now you're probably wondering why I continue to express these measurements both in RMS and peak voltage values. Uh, it's because although the voltmeter uh, converts to RMS internally, as we've discussed, uh, the oscilloscope does not. The voltages that we're going to see on the oscilloscope are expressed as peak AC output. So while I may measure 7.03 volts AC across these two leads with my voltmeter, with the oscilloscope it's going to be much closer to 10 volts. Now let's take a look at the waveform that's coming out of the secondary of our transformer. Uh, we've said uh, that when measured with the voltmeter it is 14.06 volts, that's RMS. Uh, the oscilloscope, however, is going to see a number uh, much closer to 20. It'll be around 19.88 volts of AC, and that will be the peak voltage. And here is the secondary output. If you notice from the midline up, it's one, two, three, almost four squares, which would be 19.8 or 19.9 volts. That's peak AC. And the negative waveform is exactly the same. Uh, down here at around 19.88 at 19.9 volts AC. So it's exactly as we would expect. Now let's do something tricky and engage the center tap. We're going to take a look with the oscilloscope then at the uh, output uh, curve from the upper lead to the center tap and on the same screen we'll also see what the waveform looks like from the lower lead to the center tap. We would also expect them to appear on the oscilloscope uh, measuring uh, close to 10 volts of peak AC. Well, here are those two curves. And one other thing we notice about them is they are out of phase. The upper curve is negative when the lower one is positive. Secondly, if we apply a central axis to this AC waveform, we'll see that the peak height is about two squares high, which would be 10 volts peak AC as predicted. Now let's install a diode in the upper secondary output lead uh, to rectify the output and only allow the positive waveforms to pass to the oscilloscope. And here it is, as you can see, the negative waveforms are blocked. It's still out of phase with the lower waveform. Uh, it's pretty much as we'd expect, and we have our uh, approximately 10 volt positive DC output on the upper curve and the 10 volt AC output on the bottom curve. Both of these measurements are peak, not RMS. Now we will leave the diode in the upper output lead, and let's install one in the lower output lead, also oriented to only allow the positive waveforms to go to the oscilloscope. 
and here are the two waveforms. Uh, as you can see now, they're both uh, DC. Uh, also, uh, you notice that where the blocked negative of the upper wave uh, was, it now corresponds exactly to the past positive waveform uh, from the lower lead. So we have two DC outputs that are out of phase and each is 10 volts peak. And now when I superimpose the two waves with a common base axis, you can see that each one fills in the voids in the other and we have a, a rippled DC output of 10 volts peak. Now just for fun uh, to the output from each of the diodes, uh, let's add a 22 microfarad electrolytic capacitor to smooth the ripple out of that DC output. And here we see a really nice smooth plus 10 volts peak DC output from our uh, transformer uh, through those two diodes. Well, that's about it on this power supply part 2 video in which we discussed full wave rectifiers. I'd also like to make a brief comment about the difference between the peak and RMS voltage. To me, it's like measuring uh, by inches or measuring by centimeters. As long as your measurement is accurate and you're consistent, it really doesn't matter which one you use. But if you're inconsistent, uh, say I start out measuring here by RMS and then uh, use an oscilloscope and get peak uh, readings here, uh, you're in for some grief. So be careful be precise, and be consistent. So I hope that we'll see you in part three uh, in which we'll discuss full wave bridge rectifiers. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hey Rusty, are you gonna speak? That's my boy. There's your cookie. Good boy.